everyone. This is the other side of midnight. I'm Frank Morano. Thanks for listening. Happy Friday. Hope you're hopefully your weekend is off to a good start, at least on the East Coast. Uh, if for those of you listening on the West Coast, you have no idea what you have to look forward to come Friday. So far, Friday is off to a great start. Let me tell you. All right, uh, there are a plethora of legal issues in the news, and in my experience. There is uh, there's nobody that knows the legal system like an attorney, except maybe a former attorney who has also gone to prison. We are lucky enough to assemble three of my favorite former attorneys and ex-felons, uh, and we've discussed their cases before. I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of each of their individual cases, even though each one is a pretty interesting story in their own right. Uh, but um, instead, we'll just ask them to say uh, where they went to law school and which prison they spent the most time at. Uh, I'm joined in studio first by my friend Andrew McKenna, the Deputy Director of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence in Westchester and the author of the book, a uh, great memoir. I was just recommending it to some people earlier tonight. Sheer Madness. Andrew, law school and prison, please. Albany Law School of Union University and uh, two prisons, um, Elkton, Ohio and... Uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Excellent. That very expansive response. All right. And again, you don't have to name every prison because it's only a, a four-hour program. Just the prison that you spent the most time on. Also very pleased to welcome uh, a fellow that's represented me on a lot of election law-related issues, a uh, fellow that's been uh, very well regarded as an attorney and very, very well known in the New York area, Richard Luthman. Uh, Richard, law school and prison, please. Uh, New York Law School, and I'll say uh, Brooklyn Metropolitan Detention Center. All right. Uh, and, uh, of course, Dom Crispino, who uh, last time he was here joined us in studio, but apparently the legal system has some has some restrictions on uh, what he's able to do at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning on the East Coast. We certainly understand that. Dom, um, law school in prison, please. Good morning, Frank. Uh, Georgetown University Law Center uh, and Clinton... Uh, correctional facility annex in Danamora. All right. Okay. Well, look, I, I'm going to defer to you, Dom, as uh, I think probably the best law school in the bunch, not that I'm much of an authority uh, on law schools. Uh, the Supreme Court has been making uh, a whole lot of waves, and uh, they just wrapped up their term, probably the most controversial and consequential term the Supreme Court has had in at least 20 years, possibly 50 years. Uh, give me your take on, um, we've covered this abortion decision in the in the Hobbs case a great deal. Uh, we've covered the uh, gun, the concealed carry law as it relates to New York a great deal. Give me your take on a, a subject that we haven't covered all that much, what the Supreme Court did on the EPA and what that portends for the future of federal regulation. Okay, Frank. And, uh, I, I believe that that may be the most consequential case that the, the court has decided in terms of federal power in a long time. Uh, it's West Virginia versus EPA. And what the court has done is it's taken a stranglehold now on the administrative state. You know, we have government agencies that, that regulate, provide rules. They're really the guts of this huge federal bureaucracy. And what happens is Congress will pass laws, like the Superfund Act or whatever it may be, and these agencies bring it to life. Um, so what the court has done here is said, listen, you agencies are going way too far in what you're doing with these things. So they came up with something called the major questions doctrine. So in, in an area of regulation where it's a major question, these agencies can't go off on their own now. So they want uh, the, the, uh, both the Obama administration and the Biden administration now uh, wanted to go further in terms of uh, regulating uh, electrical power uh, under the uh, to, you know, with this so-called climate change. And the court has said, no, no. Reading this statute, you do not have the power to do this administratively. Now, this is a, this is a problem that also goes further than that. I mean, you see Biden issues executive orders, Trump issued executive orders, Obama issued executive orders. You know, that's, it, it, they're, trying to, they're trying to do stuff that they don't have the power to do. And this instance here has been a long time in coming. 
there's administrative law where they've deferred to these agencies for over 40, sometimes 50 years now, and they've been called to task. It's, the, I believe, the most consequential decision of that court in this, in this term. Wow. Uh, Richard, let me uh, invite you to comment on whatever Dom uh, said there. Uh, give me your reaction to the, to the decision, and what do you think this portends for the future of uh, executive power and administrative power going forward? Well, uh, Dom is spot on. Uh, the, the there are there are other issues in that case besides the major questions doctrine, which relate to uh, separation of powers and relate to states' rights as well. Uh, a big one is that you know, Congress makes the law, not the not the administrative states. So there has to be uh, a relationship or, or a, a textual commitment uh, to what these administrative bodies are trying to do. Uh, so they just can't go out on their own with an unfettered discretion and and promulgate rules, uh, especially when it affects states. And West Virginia uh, was really affected because West Virginia is it's a big coal state, and it's a, it's a, 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 a that's a lot of its economy. These these new rules that were being uh, put into place by the EPA actually penalized that this non any non green energy sources, and there was really no congressional a stamp of approval for that. And uh, so this is going to have a, a huge effect for uh, how, how these administrative agencies can, can do things uh, without any, uh, any endorsement by Congress and what it can do when it really affects states. And it's going to carry well beyond the EPA. It's going to carry on all throughout uh, any area of administrative law. Uh, administrative rulemaking. All right, Andrew, uh, it's going to be an awfully boring hour if the three of you guys agree <laughs> on everything. Uh, give me a little dissent here. Well, Do we I'll, have any, I'll any dissent? I'll say this. This uh, term has probably had more to do with separation of powers and reining people in and, and having the different branches stay in their lane. I'll, I'll go back to, to overturning Roe v. Wade. The, the court said it perfectly. That was a court legislating the 1972 opinion uh, was awful in Roe v. Wade. And as I said, when we spoke before, it was very, very easy for Alito to just slice that opinion up, regardless of what you agree with. And same situation with the EPA ruling. This is uh, a super conservative court. They don't like big government and they're really reining people in in rain, raining the different branches in, uh, just as they should be, just as as the Constitution provides. So I, I think it's a good thing in a sense. Uh, Richard, let me uh, get your take on what we're seeing in Georgia. There's been a lot made of some subpoenas issued from a grand jury in Georgia to some people close to uh, President Trump as part of the investigation into President Trump's conduct after the uh, 2020 election. Now, uh, Lindsey Graham, one of the people that has been subpoenaed, says he's not going to comply with this subpoena in Georgia. Our colleague uh, on WABC, Rudy Giuliani, has also been subpoenaed. Whether whether or not you agree with what the scope of what this Georgia grand jury is doing, is this a wise thing that you would advise people to just disregard subpoenas? Well, it, it goes to a question about legitimacy of, of courts and legitimacy, legitimacy of, of, of uh, law enforcement and, uh, and investigations. To a certain extent, we're seeing a lot of politically motivated uh, issues here, especially now that we have a, a you know this election year in 2022, but 2024 is clearly looming. So it, it's it's coming to a point where they're 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 politically convened grand juries. Uh, we talked before about uh, about how in New York you had uh, Letitia James talk about we're going to get Trump, we're going to get him. Well, Georgia, you have kind of the same thing. You have you have uh, it's not not Democrats, but you have actually uh, uh, centrist Republicans or, or non-Trump Republicans, non-MAGA Republicans that are in control over there, and uh, aided by by the Democrats. Uh, and you know they they I guess they're going to try to make life di life difficult for for Trump and his allies. The, the problem that they have, I think, is uh, and anybody that's seen Two Thousand Mules. Uh, you know, I think Stacey Abrams is, is might be one of the biggest uh, losers if they really start digging into 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 that election. Uh, and if and if they give Trump a, a well, into platform, the twenty twenty election or the twenty eighteen election, the, the twenty twenty election. 
the 2020 election, the, the, the issue with this subpoena is, uh, is that they're, they're asking about stuff that, 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 that Trump was doing. Well, let, let's put aside the, the 2000 mules thing, because we're going to do a whole separate show on, on that. And uh, there's a lot of controversy over that. But just get, getting to the legality of what Lindsey Graham is doing here in disregarding the subpoena, understanding that you don't think that the uh, grand jury in Georgia is doing the right thing. Is it okay for people, senators or not, to just disregard subpoenas from a grand jury? Oh, no, they, they have the power to haul them in. That, that's the thing. The question becomes at that point, uh, you know, is it, 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 it becomes a political, a politically motivated prosecution defense. That, that's really what it becomes. Is there an authority uh, to bring somebody in? And they could always go and, they, and, arrest, and arrest them. They, 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 the, the power of... Uh, uh, of a uh, you know validly issued subpoena when when somebody uh, you know thumbs their nose at at, at the court uh, or at at a at a, at a subpoenaing uh, subpoenaing authority then it's uh, they always have the power to bring to bring them in and That's they have the power and not to interrupt you Richard but great point and they have the power to also Graham has the power to try to quash the subpoena and was he within his rights to discuss uh, with state officials the processes and what procedures around administering elections and it, his attorneys say that they do, but you know, he has to have that adjudicated ruled on by a court. And if he doesn't, then he gets hauled in. So is it a good idea? Generally not. If you get a subpoena, you show up, but he's the chairman of the Senate judiciary committee. And I think there's a lot more 